a long, long time ago. Way back in the year 1999. My wife, then a little girl known as Meredith Robinson, was engaged in a lively spirit and perhaps a heated debate with her parents and with her older brother over the wisdom and the propriety of going to Disney World for her birthday. Uh, my wife did not want to go to Disney World. She was more of a Chuck E. Cheese kind of gal. <laughs> yeah, are you guys familiar with Chuck E. Cheese, or is it a regional thing? Well, for any of you who aren't familiar with Chuck E. Cheese, uh, Chuck E. Cheese is the kind of place uh, that parents send their children to develop their immune systems. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of like a chicken pox party. So uh, you send your kid there. It's a, a cramped indoor space with play equipment. There's far too many children there running around, coughing, sneezing, wiping their snotty noses, pressing buttons that other kids are going to press, diving into ball pits that have never been cleaned. And, uh, and Meredith was all about it. And it didn't matter that her older brother was giving his best and most profound arguments like, Meredith, you don't understand Buzz Lightyear lives at Disney World. She was unswayed. So uh, her parents gave in. I probably would have said tough. <laughs> but they took her to Chuck E. Cheese. And after they took her to Chuck E. Cheese, they took her and the family to Disney World. Now, as you might imagine happened... After my wife visited Disney World and experienced the wonderful pleasures of being a child at Disney World, she had absolutely no desire whatsoever to go back to that mouse-infested, plague-ridden playhouse. They actually advertise that they're mouse-infested. The pleasures of Disney were far greater, so as to make Chuck E. Cheese not even worth comparing to going to Disney World. What does this have to do with God's word? <clears throat> well, if you'll recall, chapter 1, Paul establishes his, his authority as an apostle, that the very words that Paul writes are the words of Jesus to his church. Chapter 2, he gives us the gospel of justification by faith and not of works. And in chapter 3, he defended that gospel through the Galatians' own experience, through the scriptures, through the example of Abraham, and through redemptive history, that the promises that God made to Abraham were not undone by the law of Moses. Well, and today, in our passage, which is chapter 4, verses 1 to, the, to 11, Paul is making an existential argument to the Galatian Christians, and thereby to us as well. And he's saying this argument in particular. You were once at Chuck E. Cheese. God brought you to Disney World. Why in the world would you want to go back to Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> it's a good question. Now, he doesn't use Chuck E. Cheese in Disney World. He uses uh, words that parents refer to Chuck E. Cheese as, and he calls it slavery. He says, you... You, <laughs> I don't know why you guys let me preach. Um, <laughs> he says, you, uh, Christians, you have gone from slavery, and God has adopted you into his family and made you an heir. You have an inheritance from God. Why in the world would you want to go back into slavery. And that's the question he's asking the Galatian Christians today. And so if you get that, you've gotten the whole point of the sermon, uh, and you can go home and begin your Thanksgiving preparations now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't get to take communion next week. No. <laughs> so let's pick up with the word of God before I get into any more trouble. And uh, read chapter 4, 1 to 7. 
Paul writes this to the Galatians. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would implant your word into our hearts by the power of your spirit today. May, us, may we rejoice in your word, and may we be obedient to your holy and precious word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, the first two verses, uh, Paul's really helping me out. He's making an analogy. He's illustrating the point that he's going to make for the rest of this section. Which is great, because now I don't have to come up with an illustration for it. He says, uh, and to do this, he, he goes back to ancient inheritance practice. And so this morning, I, I want you to put on your thinking caps, and we're going to go back uh, 2,000 years into the ancient Roman world and, and think about the way inheritance worked back then. He says this, that uh, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave, though he's the owner of everything. What does he mean here? Well, he's saying that in the day-to-day, regular experience of the child of the master of the estate, uh, it is almost indistinguishable from that of a slave. He is under the authority of his father, as is the slave. Uh, He is responsible to be obedient to that authority. And the father is committed to providing for the needs of both his servants and his children. And so the main difference that we find between a child and a slave in the Roman world is that a child has great potential, whereas a slave doesn't. Now, in the Roman world, a slave could reasonably hope to save up and and purchase his own freedom. Uh, That was actually a regular occurrence. But a slave could never hope to inherit from his master or mistress. Meanwhile, he's saying the potential of the son is very different. The outcome of the son is very different from the outcome of a slave because the son, one day, at the moment when the father determines, as it says, verse 2, till the date set by his father, the son will come into his inheritance. So that's the analogy. Do we got it? Uh, Okay. Now Paul, in verses 3 to 7 is going to apply the analogy. He says this, In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What is he saying here uh, when he says, when we were children? I don't think he's making a Jew or a Gentile distinction. I think right here he's saying that the pre-conversion of the uh, pre-conversion experience of the Christian is that of slavery. Paul is not saying slavery is a good thing here. He's using it as a negative example. And he does this in Romans chapter 6. There's a a long history of describing a pre-conversion life apart from Christ as slavery. In Romans chapter 6 verse 15 he says uh, that apart from Christ you are slaves to your sins. In Ephesians 2, he makes a similar analogy, and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He compares it to slavery, to the evil one, to Satan, being under the power of the prince of this world. And of course, uh, this theme also runs throughout the Old Testament. Uh, What is the single greatest act of redemption? What is the single greatest act of salvation in the Old Testament? Anyone? We can, we'll we'll be, we'll go back and forth. 
It's the Exodus, where God rescues his people from what he describes as the iron smelting furnace of slavery in Egypt. And in all of his dealings with Israel, and in his covenant dealings with them, he continually reminders, reminds them, I am the Lord your God who rescued you out of slavery in the house of Egypt. And so the scriptures are replete with these references to our pre-conversion being slavery. But here he says something a little weird. He says, you are enslaved to the, depending on your translation, elementary principles of the world. Uh, you are enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world, or some translations just say elements of the world. Well, what's going on here? Uh, the word there in the Greek is actually, uh, there's three main translational options there. And so the, uh, your different translations will reflect that. Uh, I take the most basic understanding, which is you are enslaved to the elements of the world, the stoichei of the world. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, he's, he's, he's explaining things in a pagan way which they can understand. So you were enslaved to the elements of these worlds. These were uh, earth, air, fire, water, their understanding of the natural world. It also referred to sort of the heavenly bodies, the stars, the moon, and the sky. Uh, if this sounds incredibly pagan to you, it's because it is. And with all of these elements, there were spiritual entities which were associated with them. So he's essentially making the same argument he is in Ephesians chapter 2. That you were enslaved to dark spiritual forces before you knew Christ. But where does he go from there? Well, uh, that's the bad news. He's reminding us of where we were before Christ. And in verses 4 to 7, he shows us how God demonstrated his love for us. It says God, <clears throat> so uh, if you look at that in, in verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Uh, I'm just going to get a little theological here for just a moment. Uh, it doesn't say that at the fullness of time, God created Jesus Christ. Uh, this text and many others teach us that actually Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, has always existed. And, and, and that's why the scriptures describe the advent of Christ, which Advent starts next week. Uh, they describe the advent of Christ as the time when Jesus took on flesh. He was incarnated. Um, Brother Ben, Brother Ben, there is a very masculine pink water bottle at the back of this sanctuary. Would you mind bringing that to me? Um, thanks, Dan. I'm just... My voice is, uh... <laughs> so Jesus has always existed, and that's why we talk about, thanks, got dry mouth. Uh, just so we're clear, this is my wife's water bottle. that I am confidently using. All right, so Jesus always existed. He didn't, uh, you know, the, the Gospels are about how God became man. They're not about how a human became God. So we established that. Uh, the first thing he says about it is that it happened at the fullness of time. And what, what he means by that is that Jesus is coming. The timing of it was no accident. That Jesus came at the precise moment when God intended for him to come. Uh, I think sometimes we think, well, you know, why didn't God come you know, in the modern era, after the advent of, of television or movies, and then we'd have film of them, and then everybody would believe, right? Well, God, uh, he makes no accidents. And as he sovereignly administrated over the course of human events, he decided the precise moment that he would send the Redeemer into the world to save the world and accomplish his missions. It, it, it's not unlike uh, during the Super Bowl between the Patriots and the Falcons, where Tom Brady decided the precise moment he would actually begin to start playing football in the third quarter and pull off the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. There is a right moment to begin doing that. <laughs> okay, so uh, God sent him at the fullness of time. That's what Paul means by that. Uh, why did God send him and how did God send him? Well, we, we get that right here. We'll, we'll first deal with how. It says, born of woman. 
Now, this is to remind us that Jesus experienced life as we did as a human. He was fully God and he was fully man. And in his humanity, it says he was born under the law. Jesus was a Jewish man born under the law of Moses. He was born under the law's requirements for righteousness, but that's where he and we split. Because for, the, for us, that's very bad news. Because the law says, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things in the book of the law and do them. But for Jesus and for us, that's wonderful news because Jesus did abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. And that's how God can justify us on account of Christ's righteousness. So why then did God send him? We could easily go to John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that's true. And we can keep reading and, and see that as well. He was born under the law, the text says, so he could liberate, so he could redeem those who were under the law. And Jesus came to redeem you from the penalty of your sins and your own inability to save yourself. He came and fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law for you. And he died the death that your transgression of the law deserved. He was your perfect substitute. He was born like us, born of woman. He lived beside us. And he died for us. So that if we trust in him, we can be reconciled to our God. And receive righteousness from Christ last part of this verse I think is just super cool. Uh, and the verse I'm referring to is verse 5. To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Ultimately, the Son of God became human so that we humans could become sons of God. I'll say that again. The Son of God became human so that we humans could become sons of God. Well, that's sexist. <laughs> yes, I am applying the word son to all of you today who are placing your faith in Christ. In the ancient world, it was the son who would have an inheritance. And that's why Paul is deliberately referring to all of you, men and women, as sons of God and as sons of of Abraham. And actually, it's really progressive because he's saying to a church of people in the first century, a, a church where there are women present who would not inherit, he's saying that in the economy of God, you are an heir of salvation. You are an heir of the God who created the universe. That's incredible. And so, uh, women this morning, you, you should get comfortable being referred to as the Son of God, just as we men have to get comfortable being referred to as the bride of Christ. It's a wonderful truth. And we don't talk about adoption very often, but when you repent and trust in Jesus, God actually adopts you into his family. Think about that. Now, a lot of Christians are involved in international adoption or adoption from foster care, and it's a wonderful process. Uh, you take somebody out of a really dire situation, an orphan of some sort, uh, with very little economic opportunity or educational opportunity, many times they don't have access to a gospel preaching church, and you bring them into a loving family uh, where they're sacrificed for and they're, they're given godly authority. They have economic opportunities and educational opportunities, and, and if it's a Christian family, they, they get to experience and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful process. It's an incredible improvement in their uh, life. Well, if that's an incredible improvement, think of the disparity between us in slavery to our sins and being adopted into God's family. How much greater of a difference is that? It should break your brain thinking about how wonderful it is that you've been adopted by God. Now, in verses 6 and 7, Paul's just going to list some of the benefits of being adopted into God's family. He says, God sent the Spirit of God into our hearts. Now, this isn't the main point here, but I just want to show you something real quick. Because in verse 
6, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who's very skeptical of Christianity. They may say something like, well, the word Trinity is never in the scriptures. And that's true. The word Trinity is not. And yet the Trinity is very present in all of the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. And we see it right here, one example of many, in verse 6. He says, and because you are sons, God the Father has sent the Spirit, Holy Spirit, of his Son, Jesus Christ, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. <laughs> it's a wonderful exercise of the Holy Trinity. The Father wills Jesus Christ to come and accomplish redemption for you. The Son comes and accomplishes your redemption. And then the Holy Spirit applies the work of the Son in your life. It's such a beautiful process. But what else does the Holy Spirit do? What does that application look like? Uh, on Thursday, it was actually Aria's last day of daycare, and I went to go pick her up from her classroom. And I, I opened the door to her class, and I didn't see her anywhere. So when I opened it, I said, knock, knock. And as soon as I said the words, knock, knock, my daughter, who was off and to the right behind the door, responded, Dada, <laughs> which was incredible. And shortly thereafter, she was uh, running across the room, and she came up, and she hugged me on the legs. And she, it was wonderful. She didn't ever see me, but she recognized my voice, and my voice filled her with joy. And she ran to me and hugged me. That's why I'm going to hate it when she's a teenager. <laughs> but this is a picture of what the Spirit of God does in our lives as Christians. He sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, Christianity is not merely a cerebral or an intellectual religion. It is both of those things. Theology is important, but there's a subjective, spiritual, and emotional aspect to our faith that cannot be neglected. And we see that uh, the Spirit of God enables us to recognize the voice of our Father when we hear the Word of God or when we read the Word of God, we recognize that it's truly from Him. And as the Spirit lives in our hearts, it teaches us to approach God with a childlike confidence that we belong to Him, crying, Abba. And we've heard that term a thousand times, but that is a very strange term for a Jew to apply to Yahweh. That's an Aramaic term of endearment. It's like saying, Daddy. That's what Jesus taught us to say. Jesus and Paul, the, the scriptures are teaching us to relate to our God as Father. That we're his beloved children. We're no longer enemies. And we can sprint to him yelling, Daddy, when we hear his voice. One of the most fundamental ways the Spirit helps us in our lives is by revealing to us that we truly belong to Christ. By revealing to us that we've truly been adopted by God the Father into his family. That's not all the Spirit does. We'll look at some more uh, in, in chapters 5 and 6, but that's a, uh, that's a very important one. And I wonder this morning uh, if you've experienced this confidence of the Spirit. Can you relate to your creator so as to call him Abba, Daddy? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to pass away tonight, you would be ushered into the presence of your heavenly Father and seated at his table? If not, I'll tell you the secret to receiving the Spirit. It doesn't matter if you've been in church your whole life or if this is the first time that you've heard the gospel. You're called to behold the Son of God, trust in Him, turn from your sins, and believe in nothing, and believe in Jesus Christ alone to save you. And you can receive the righteousness of Christ and be given the gift of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Listen, God is your creator. And he freely gives and loves to adopt into his family. And he would love to make you his child and an heir to the kingdom of God. And you can have rock solid confidence that God is your father. But 
for those of you who can honestly answer yes to this question this morning. Yes, I, I do relate to God as Father. The Holy Spirit has given me assurance of my uh, justification before him. Let me ask you this. Do you believe this truth even when you mess up? Uh, do you believe this truth even when you sin and you feel like the biggest hypocrite in the world? And you wonder how God can continue putting up with you. Do you have a desire to punish yourself? Are, are you driven into despair? Are you trying to prove yourself worthy of God's blessing? Or do you want to hide your sin from God and from others or just pretend like it wasn't actually sin? Do you justify the things that you've done which are wrong even though you know that they are wrong? I do. And it's the wrong move. You know, there's, there's a good chance when I pick up my daughter from daycare that at some point in the day, my beautiful little devious daughter has whacked some kid in the head with a building block or pushed someone down the slide or done some other uh, depraved action. But at the end of the day, my daughter is still my daughter. And my love for her hasn't changed. And while I'm not going to tolerate bad behavior, the bond of love is not broken. And she's not going to stop being a member of my family. And so when you mess up, remember that running away from God is the exact thing that the evil one wants you to do. But God is your father. Don't you think he wants to hear from you when you've messed up? <laughs> do you, he, he knows you. Do you think you've surprised him in your sin? Don't you think he's eager to forgive you and restore you and restore your assurance that you belong to him? Listen, if you are in Christ, the father loves you more than you could possibly ever love your own child. And the best way to deal with your sin is to go directly to your Abba in heaven. Now, in verse 7, Paul's just going to close out this analogy once more. He says this, You Christian, you Galatian, you Christians here today, uh, are no longer slaves, but you are a son of God. And if you are a son of God, you are his heir. Now, unless your last name is Bezos... Uh, I imagine that at some point in your life, you've looked at what others have, uh, perhaps those who have considerably more than you, and you thought to yourself, man, if only I had been born into that family, if only I had been born with those kind of resources, my life would really be different for the better. Well, let me give you the best antidote to envy. Uh, Christian, when you look around and you see those who have more than you and you're tempted to envy... Remind yourself of this. You have been adopted by the all-powerful creator of the universe. The one to whom everything ultimately belongs. The cattle on a thousand hills. Which probably sounds great to you guys. <laughs> not only this, not only does your father own everything... But you are an heir to God. And the Holy Spirit is the down payment of your inheritance. The first fruits of our life to come. So don't fall for the trap of loving the treasures of this world. You've got something so much better. And I think we have a slide uh, for this in 1 Peter. Peter describes it far better than I ever could. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Brothers and sisters, that's good news. And if you were Pentecostal, you'd be jumping up and down right now. All right, not even an amen. Okay. Amen, brother. So we've seen that to go from being a non-Christian to becoming a Christian is moving from slavery to our sins and the elements of this world and becoming sons of the Most High God and heirs of God. We've gone from Chuck E. Cheese to Disney World. Now Paul 
wants to address the Galatians' inexplicable desire to renounce their adoption and move back into slavery. And that's what we'll see in verses 8 to 11 as we close. So uh, please look at verse 8 with me. The word of the Lord says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So what is he saying? He's saying you've been rescued and known by God. You've been adopted into the family of God. You're no longer a slave. You are a son. Previously we were unknown to God. Now we know God, he says. And then he puts it more accurately, or rather you are known by God. Listen, it's one thing to know someone. It's another thing to be known by someone. Uh, Chris Evans, the guy who plays Captain America, he was raised in nearby Sudbury. And if you went there today, I I imagine that you could find people who would tell you, yeah, I know Chris Evans. Yeah, I know Captain America. We went to high school together. Uh, And I could tell you that, yeah, I know Captain America. But it's one thing to say, I know this person. It's another thing entirely to, you know, if I were in Bible study on Wednesday and I picked up my phone and Captain America's on the other line. Chris Evans. That would be different. That would mean that I am known by Captain America. There's a a big difference between the two. He's saying you are known by the all-powerful creator of the universe. And he says law-keeping, which is what the Galatians are trying to do, is renouncing our adoption and turning back into slavery. He says, after all of these blessings, after all this wonderful freedom, after you've been adopted as sons in the family of God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. After all of this, why would you want to go back? Now, there's, he's doing something really incredible here. The, the days and months and seasons and years, he's, he's talking about the ceremonial uh, festival, festivals, Sabbaths, Sabbath years, all of this that Israel was required to do under the law. He's saying, here, here's the incredible part that would have been radical for a Jew to say. He's saying that your attempt at gaining righteousness through this law keeping is the same thing as your slavery to the elementary principles of the world. He's saying you're no better off trying to get to God through law-keeping than you were through your pagan worship before you knew Christ. You say, well, that's just the Galatians. We we don't struggle with, with wanting to go back to slavery. If you recall the Israelites in the wilderness after they had experienced the incredible signs and wonders of God after they saw the ten plagues which God brought onto Pharaoh, after God led them through the wilderness as as he split the Red Sea and they walked over on dry ground, after they had seen the Red Sea come back and swallow up Pharaoh's army. The Israelites were on the very precipice of entering into the promised land. And what did they say? God's brought us out here to kill us. Oh, that we could go back to Egypt. Oh, our lives were so much better when we were slaves. The promised land was right there before them. And they grumbled against their leaders. Listen, there's always a danger for those of us as Christians to forget about the grace of God and his miraculous saving power and to make it all about us again. But the good news of the gospel is what Jesus Christ has done for you and not what we've done to earn God's acceptance. And yes, we're called to live in a certain way in response to that grace, but we do not live that way to earn that grace. And that's where the Galatians went off the rails. And so when we're tempted to take pride in what we've accomplished or think that God loves us and accepts us for any reason other 
than the righteousness of Christ applied to our lives through faith, then we've gone off the rails. We are showing ourselves that we really wish we were in Egypt, that we want to go back into slavery in Chuck E. Cheese. Listen, the marvelous riches and the blessings of the gospel have been given to you in Christ. God has adopted you into his family. And Paul's saying, if this is really true of you, he says, I I hope I haven't labored you over in vain, but if this is really true of you, then this is something to celebrate. You are an heir to the kingdom of God. That is really good news. That's exciting, people. We are God's children. And if it wasn't a pandemic, I'd say, let's go back to my house and have burgers and talk about it. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's a really good thing, but let's be sure, let's, let's not desire to go back into slavery because that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Let's pray.